All right, welcome back. Um, last video, we talked through the shoot system, and so now we have one more plant system to talk about, um, and that is the leaf system. So as I think most of us are familiar with, the leaf is really the main site of photosynthesis. And the morphology of the leaf is really adapted to this function in that it has a wide and flat part that we call the blade and, and a narrower part that attaches to the stem of the plant or the shoot of the plant and that's called the petiole. Um, and so really this morphology, having this flattened out blade and petiole allows for a couple of things. One is increased surface area. For photosynthesis. And then, of course, this allows the plus increased surface area allows the plant to maximize the light harvesting capabilities, maximize light harvest. And it's not just the flat blade that allows it to do this. The petiole actually, the petiole, that stalk that attaches to the flat blade helps with maximizing light harvest as well because the petiole can actually adjust how, how the leaf is, or how the leaf is displayed in the environment depending on which direction the light's coming from. So that's a, a cool function. So this blade and petiole arrangement is really um, all optimized for maximizing light harvest for photosynthesis. Um, importantly though, this, there's also a trade-off. So what I mean by a trade-off is sort of a give and take, right? And this trade-off is with water loss. Um, remember that in the surface of the leaf is where those breaks in the cuticle are, the stomata um, that can be opened and closed depending on the availability of water. So stomata are places where water can be lost from the plant. And so depending on the, the size and the shape, um, the size, the, the thickness, um, the shape of the leaf is directly related to the environment in terms of how wet and or dry that environment is. So there's this trade-off constantly um, between the morphology of the leaf and the um, trying to minimize water loss in the plant. And so in along with that, um, that diversity that the um, along with the that morphology, there's of course a huge diversity of leaf shapes. And I just want to go over sort of two main uh, uh, diversity of leaves, leaf, leaf shapes and um, uh, and the arrangement of veins in the leaf. And so that's what I want to show here. Um, this is called the venation pattern. Venation, and that's the arrangement of veins in the leaf. And this is an important thing because remember that the, for photosynthesis to occur, water has to be delivered from the soil to the point of photosynthesis, which is out there in the leaves. And so this is done through this vascular tissue and these veins lead out into the leaves and then break up into smaller and smaller veins to get to those cells that are actually doing the photosynthesis themselves. And so in plants, we see um, two, major, uh, two major patterns, venation patterns. Um, one of those is this branched and, and network or net-like venation pattern. And this is what we call reticulate venation or net-like venation patterns. And the other is like what we see in grasses with the more linear leaves, and that's this parallel venation pattern where all those veins actually run parallel to each other and they don't interconnect in, in that network. Um, like we see in reticulate venation. So these are two different ways that the plant is delivering water out into the leaves where photosynthesis is going. I bring this up as a, a little bit of an aside um, because 
the, this actually characterizes two groups um, of two major groups of angiosperms or of the flowering plants, and that's the dicots with their net-like venation or reticulate venation, and the monocots with their parallel venation. And so you'll notice that I put dicots in quotation marks. And so if you guys remember what that means, and when I put them in quotation marks, that is because dicots are actually a paraphyletic group. So dicots are a traditionally recognized plant group. It's important that people do talk about this today and they do all share this characteristic of having net veined leaves, but they are not monophyletic. Monocots, on the other hand, are monophyletic. And so let's just take a little aside here and actually look at um, the phylogeny of angiosperms and look at some of the characteristics that make up monocots and dicots. And so the first thing that I want to do here is point out where our dicot lineages are. And so dicots, or what are traditionally recognized as dicots, are out here in this clade that we have labeled as U dicots. U means true, dicots meaning two, um, two cotyledons. The others that are dicots are these things that are labeled as the basal angiosperms as well. So these lineages, the magnolias, ostrobiales, nymphiales, and amborella, these are all dicots as well. So what does this refer to? So I'm gonna make a little table over here with dicot characteristics and monocot characteristics. Um, the first thing, the name itself refers to the number of cotyledons. So cotyledons are seed leaves. Um, so these are those first leaves that emerge after a seed germinates and uh, that seedling starts to grow. You'll oftentimes notice two leaves that are not morphologically, that are they're not the same as the the rest of the leaves are the true leaves of the plant. These are the cotyledons. So these are formed within the seed and emerge with the seed. And so dicots have two cotyledons. Monocots just have a single cotyledon. And so if we look at the ancestral character, the ancestral characteristics for all of angiosperms, it actually is that we have two cotyledons. And I'll just put on there so you remember what these are. These are seed leaves. And so two cotyledons is the ancestral characteristic for all of angiosperms. So these, all the basal angiosperms, these all have two cotyledons. Um, and then our eudicots all have two cotyledons. The monocots are, like I said, a monophyletic group and a synapomorphy for what monocots is the presence of the reduction to one cotyledon. Another characteristic that's looked at is the distribution of vascular bundles. Um, remember vascular bundles are those veins in the vascular tissue. And if we just look at a cross section of vascular bundles in dicots, what we see if we look at a cross section of a stem, the vascular bundles are all arranged in a ring. And that ring um, is a, a uniform ring, which is really defined by the vascular cambium. And so vascular bundles being arranged in a ring is another ancestral characteristic for all of angiosperms. Vascular bundles in a ring. And so these are separated by that vascular cambium. Okay, so the vascular bundles being in, uh, in a ring are also, is also an ancestral characteristic for all of angiosperms. So all of these dicots have it the eudicots have it, the basal angiosperms have it, the monocots don't. Instead, the vascular bundles are scattered. And so if we were to look at a cross section of a monocot stem, what we have are the scattered arrangement of vascular bundles in the stem. So this is different than being arranged in a ring. What this means is that there is no vascular cambium. These don't have secondary growth. Monocots cannot produce wood. 
they don't have secondary growth, so no vascular cambium. And what that means is no wood. So we don't have secondary, we don't have secondary xylem. All right, no vascular cambium there. These are scattered vascular bundles. That's another synapomorphy for monocots. And then the third one here is having net venation. Um, and so I'll go ahead and throw that on here. We have that reticulate venation and all as, as the ancestral characteristic for all of angiosperms. So our basal dicots have that reticulate venation in the leaves. Um, eudicots have that reticulate venation in the leaves. But when we get to monocots, we see parallel venation in the leaves. So those leaves are parallel venation. So monocots have multiple good synapomorphies, one cot reduction to one cotyledon, scattered vascular bundle, and parallel venation. Dicots, on the other hand, are not monophyletic, they're paraphyletic, and they, um, all of angiosperms have the ancestral condition of having vascular bundles arranged in a ring, um, separated by that vascular cambium, two cotyledons, um, or two seed leaves, and then reticulate venation in their leaves. So dicots, as we traditionally um, recognize them, um, are not, uh, you know, are, are not monophyletic. Um, I'm just want, I'm just seeing that I need to fill out my table here. So we've got scattered vascular bundles. In this one, net venation and parallel venation. Okay. So what's with this dicot characteristic or with, with uh, dicots? So, so I said, you know, this is traditional that we separate into monocots and dicots. And people are still going to talk about dicots even though they're not paraphyletic. And so I put those in quotation marks when I say dicots. We do have a clade that we call the eudicotyledonae or the eudicots. Like I said, this means true dicots. Well, our basal angiosperms over here are no less true dicots. They have two cotyledons than these ones are here. So it's kind of a crappy name, but it is what it is. We've settled on this name for you dicotyledons. It's the majority of what we call dicots, and I think that's really where the name stems from. But these do actually have a really good synapomorphy, and that's this synapomorphy of having tricolpate pollen. So here's a pollen grain down here, colpe are little pores in the pollen that the pollen tube actually emerges from um, after fertilization occurs, or after pollination occurs, rather, to, to have fertilization occur. A pollen tube will germinate out of the colpe. Um, in, in this clade, we actually have tricolpate pollen, so there are three colpe on that. In other plants, monocots and our basal angiosperms, these are either monosulcate, just one uh, pore on them, or polysulcate, they, but they're not tricolpate. So tricolpate pollen is a really good synapomorphy for that. Um, because of that, I prefer to call this clade the tricolpates because that actually refers to a monophyletic uh, group when a synapomorphy associated with that. But, um, but that name, uh, tricolpates, is informally caught on. It's not a formal name. Eudicotyledonae is that formal name. But I mentioned the tricolpate pollen because this is actually, remember, pollen preserves in the fossil record just like spores do um, because pollen has that sporopollen pollen in as well. Um, and so this actually lets us look for one of the major groups of angiosperms in the fossil record, and that's these tricolpates. Um, and so we see them occur, find, we see them as one of the earliest evidences actually of angiosperm diversity in the fossil record. Okay. An aside, which is very common with me, as you as you've seen, but my I came to this because of the venation patterns. We see major venation patterns in leaves, um, and those vary in between major groups of of plants. Okay, after that aside, let's head back to leaves and look at some of the diversity. So, along with the venation patterns in leaves, we also have um, differences in the way leaves are actually put together. 
um, in terms of their overall morphology. Um, what I want to show here is two different types of leaves. One, the first on the left is that first leaf we saw. This is what we call a simple leaf. Um, what that means is that it has an undivided blade. Uh, so the leaf blade itself is undivided. It's got this one leaf blade. And that's to contrast with what we call a compound leaf. A compound leaf is, has the blade actually divided into leaflets. So in both cases, we have a blade and petiole. Um, in both the simple leaf and the compound leaf. In the compound leaf, that blade is divided into smaller leaflets, but we still have that blade and petiole morphology. Um, but we have these individual small leaflets. Okay, so how do we actually determine, um, uh, oh, sorry, one, 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 uh, one added modification. So this blade can be divided into leaflets. We can actually have leaflets that are multiply compound. I don't know if that's a word, multiply compound. Um, in this case, this is one that we would call bipinnate or bipinnately compound. So this is the blade and we have the petiole down here. And we can see that each individual leaflet is then again divided into a bunch of leaflets. And this can actually go multiple times. You can have bipinnately compound leaves, tripinnately compound leaves. Um, and so where those, that, that next leaflet division would be divided again into a compound leaf. Okay, so in all of these cases, how do I tell that this is actually um, one leaf, well, that's easy. How do I tell that this is one leaf or, and not a whole bunch of leaves, each arranged on a stem? Rather, this is one leaf with leaflets. How do I actually tell the difference between that? And it has to do with uh, how we actually define a leaf. And we define a leaf um, based on the position of an axillary bud. And so a leaf is a leaf, so it's defined by the position of a lateral bud in its axis or axle. And so here I have a compound leaf with a petiole and we see that the petiole leads out to some individual leaflets. And so here's some individual leaflets of a compound leaf. How do I know this is a compound leaf? Well, if I look down to where it attaches to the stem, I actually see that in the axle, leaf axle, has that axillary bud a lateral bud. So we see the position of the lateral bud is what defines the leaf itself. Um, if you look in the axle of where the leaves, leaflets attach, we'll see that there's no axillary bud uh, where those leaflets attach. And so you need to look for where, the, um, where there's an axillary bud or not to be able to define whether this is a compound leaf or a simple leaf. Um, and so in this case, we would have an axillary bud down here. In this case, we would have an axillary bud down here and none in the positions where the leaflets attach. And then same thing in this one, we would have an axillary bud down at the, where, this can, where these connect to the stem. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. That's how we actually define um, where what makes a leaf, where the leaf, uh, and where the leaf actually is. So one other, um, and so that's some of our diversity of leaves. One other 
um, thing that I would like to mention with respect to leaf diversity is different types of leaves that we have. Um, and so this is two examples, one of a conifer, this is a pine tree here, the genus Pinus. Um, and uh, one example that I'd like to, to show is, um, is having needle-like leaves. So we see those needle-like leaves in pine trees. We also see them in, uh, in angiosperm groups. Um, I'm blanking on what this is actually a picture of, but this is a picture of a desert plant. Um, but needle-like leaves are an adaptation for dry environments. So this goes, gets back to that idea of leaf shape, that blade being, having a trade-off between maximizing your photosynthetic area and minimizing water loss. So in dry environments, that's done by decreasing the surface area. So decreased surface area in needle-like leaves, um, which decreases water loss. But the trade-off is that there's less photosynthesis per leaf. And that's just a trade-off that is done. But by decreasing that surface area, um, we decrease the water loss. And then you have to increase the number of leaves that you have out there to be able to photosynthesize. Um, and so in this, in this desert plant, we actually see that the stem is green and photosynthetic as well. And so decreasing the photosynthesis per leaf, but our photosynthetic area, um, uh, which decreases our water loss, but our photosynthetic area is actually still pretty large. Okay, other ways that uh, plants are, um, oh, so just, I will mention, uh, so this is an adaptation for dry environments. It's also important that this is an adaptation for cold environments. And so cold and dry actually are very similar to each other. Water, when it's cold, is, uh, especially frozen water is not available. So frozen water is unavailable. Cold environments also have the same characteristics as dry environments do where oftentimes that water is not available for the plant to use. Okay, another uh, way that plants, um, that plants display their leaves is um, with very, in, in, diver in diversity of ways, is with varying the leaf arrangement, or we also call this the phyllotaxy. So phil means leaf. So that refers to the arrangement of leaves on the stem. And the goal of different leaf arrangements is to maximize photon capture. So maximizing the capture of that light energy. And I wanna just walk through some of the prime, uh, the main types of, uh, the main types of leaf arrangement. Um, the first of those is shown here and that's alternate leaf arrangement. And what alternate leaf arrangement is, is we have one leaf per node. And I'll just say that that alternate leaf arrangement is actually, well, all leaf arrangement is actually determined by the shoot apical meristem. And so here's the apical meristem in a plant with alternate leaf arrangement. And what we're seeing with these numbers here is the numbering the leaf primordia from the newest one to the oldest one. And so we'll see that number one is here, number two is over here, number three is over here, number four is over here, number five is over here, and we can actually follow this out in a spiral that goes around uh, each of those leaf primordia in this alternate leaf arrangement. Well, so each of these little bumps that we see here are all of those leaf primordia. And one of the cool things here um, is that in all, so that alternate arrangement, we've got one leaf per node, and these are actually initiated um, at a, a very precise angle of 137 
0.5 degrees is the angle that is the different and it is the angle of initiation between these alternate leads. So again, 137.5 degrees. What that ends up doing is creating a very perfect spiral um, that we see throughout nature, actually, in many different uh, groups of organisms. And a mathem an Italian mathematician, Fibonacci, actually described this pattern as what's now known as a Fibonacci sequence. Um, but it's, a, and it, it's, like I said, a pattern that we see throughout nature. So kind of a special, uh, a special number, an alternate leaf arrangement in the apical meristem of a, of a plant actually shows that same thing. Um, really cool. But what this does is it allows the plant to get the maximum amount of light with minimal shading of the leaves below. So maximize light capture with minimal shading of the leaves below. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's alternate leaf arrangement. Of course, not all leaves are arranged in that alternate, uh, in that alternate form. Um, and it, even in alternate leaf arrangement, we see um, sometimes uh, some variations in that. And so um, in some plants, even though those are initiated at 137 degrees, they will actually, the stem will twist. So they look like they're 180 degrees apart from each other. Um, that's one, uh, one difference in, uh, in, in that leaf arrangement. The, another one is depicted here, and this is what we call a rosette. And so this is still alternate arrangement. So alternate phyllotaxy. But this, in, in this case, we've got little or no well, little um, internode elongation. And so this is actually a dandelion that you're seeing right here. And you know, these will overwinter as these rosettes and then the next year will actually grow. But we're, you know, you can see how that alternate leaf arrangement with that little internode uh, elongation actually basically puts leaf area for photosynthesis everywhere that the light is gonna hit. And that's a really nice, um, nice way to maximize that, uh, maximize that photosynthetic area. Okay, what are other types of phyllotaxy that we see? Uh, um, one very common is opposite arrangement of leaves. And so here we see opposite. And this opposite just means two leaves per node. And so here we see at every node, we have two leaves diverging from that node. Um, this one is one where this actually oftentimes is, will shade the leaves below it. Um, and so oftentimes when we have opposite leaf arrangement, we have a situation that we see here, which is that each, each successive uh, series of leaves rotates 90 degrees. And so this is one that we call opposite and decusset. And what that means is that there's a 90 degree offset between nodes. So our first set of leaves comes out here, then it's rotated 90 degrees, and the next node it's rotated 90 degrees again, the next node is rotated 90 degrees again, and the next node is rotated back. And so in that case, it's similar to the rosette where we're maximizing that photosynthetic area for light harvesting. All right, the last type of leaf arrangement that we see is called world leaf arrangement. And this is uh, more than two leaves per node, so three or more, and we see all of these leaves all emerging um, from that same part of the plant, or the same node on the plant. Um, world leaf arrangement is what that one's called. And this very, these are these are variations that are 
oftentimes, um, oftentimes, you know, group specific, clade specific, a monophyletic group will often have all world leaves or all opposite leaves. These are common for, for example, plant families or plant genera. Um, the main point I want to get here is that the different leaf arrangements are all there to maximize the, the, that variation, is to maximize the efficiency of light capture for that plant. That's really our goal in the different leaf arrangements that we see. All right, I want to talk a little bit now about plasticity in the leaves. Um, and so this actually we alluded to um, a little bit before uh, in when I was looking at plasticity in the shoot system, but we, we can look at this specifically now with phenotypic plasticity in leaves. Um, so although leaves don't grow continuously, they do express pheno exhibit phenotypic plasticity um, depending on you know where they are in the uh, environment and so leaves grown in the shade like this oak leaf on the left here will oftentimes be broader and thinner where on the same individual plant sun leaves leaves that are at the top of the tree or leaves grown in the sun will be smaller and thicker And this is that trade-off with between light capture and water loss. So in that full sun, we don't need as much photosynthetic area to capture the same amount of photons, but what we do need is to make that smaller so we're not losing water. Um, in that sort of full sun environment. While in the shade, we need to get more surface area to be able to capture more photons, but, um, and the relative humidity on the outside in the shade is higher than it is in the sun, and so we don't get as much water loss from the somata. Um, so oftentimes we'll see this broader, thinner leaves in the shade and smaller, thicker leaves um, in the sun. And this is seen in both Angus firms, like this oak example here, um, as well as uh, my favorite example, which is in the sequoia. Um, this is the coast redwood so the, in the genus sequoia. Um, and just as a quick aside, this picture um, is actually from a National Geographic uh, uh, where they showed um, how they photograph these, these, immense, these big trees. And it actually is done in a whole series of photographs. And if you look closely, you can see this dude the photographer at different points in these in this tree where he is photographing um, uh, and uh, mapping this one tree out. So this gives you an idea of the, the size of this tree. There he is at the base. Um, this is a big, uh, these are big trees. Tallest trees on earth are in the coast redwoods that get over 400 feet tall. Um, and that's about the, that's the maximum size that plants can actually move that water. Uh, which we'll, we'll talk about that in a, a, at a later point. But um, the main thing I wanted to show you here is that in a tree like the sequoia, where down low in the canopy, uh, low in the, in the tree, we have what are called shade leaves. So here's the shade leaves. They're broader, thinner, bigger, uh, uh, bigger photosynthetic area um, to capture that light. And then at the top of the tree, you have what are called sun leaves. And these sun leaves are actually smaller and needle-like um, and uh, to minimize that water loss um, and capturing the same amount of light. And so we see that in the coast redwood sequoia, we see different morphologies at the top of the tree and at the bottom of the tree, sun leaves and shade leaves. Awesome. Let's uh, and with some modifications of the leaves that we see um, and some special, some special leaves. And so bulbs, many didn't know, I'm sure, that bulbs, like the bulbs of an onion in this case, are actually modified leaf bases. So bulbs are made up of the modified leaf bases. And these are actually modified 
the base of the leaf is thick and succulent and modified for carbohydrate storage. Of sugars and starches, carbohydrate storage. And so what each of these layers of the onion represent is actually another leaf and a leaf base, overlapping leaf base. Um, that are storing all those carbohydrates, which is why, of course, we use this as a food source. Um, it's storing it not for us as a food source, though, right? It's storing it for the plant as a food source to be able to come back the next spring from that underground storage organ. In a onion or in a bulb, the stem is actually just this little hard part right at the base. Um, that's the stem of the plant. The rest of that onion itself is actually leaves um, and leaf bases. The rest of the plant is all leaves and leaf bases. All right, succulent leaves like this aloe shown here is a modification for water storage. And so here's an aloe leaf that's cut in a cross section um, and we see that just dripping wet. That's all that water that's modified for water storage in the water shorted and, you know, environments that have water as a, as a scarcity. Um, tendrils are a specific, we see tendrils in like in peas, for example, um, where these actually have leaves that are modified for uh, climbing. So the, the tendril part of, uh, that wraps around the substrate for climbing, that is actually a modified leaf, a leaf that is modified into that tendril specifically meant for, uh, for climbing. All right, let's look at a couple more uh, uh, special modifications. Uh, the, the, um, one of them that, uh, another that we're mostly familiar with in poinsettias is these floral mimics. Um, there, poinsettia is just an example of this. Um, there are actually many plants that do this where the leaves are modified for a pollinator attraction. So the red leaves of poinsettia, although they're pretty at Christmas time, are not for Christmas decorations. They're actually for uh, decorations for the flowers. So the flowers of these are actually really small um, and found just right there uh, in the center, we see those little yellow flowers. Um, but then the leaves that are big and red sort of act like the petals on many other flowers where they're, mod they're actually the pollinator attracting organ um, as those, uh, as the leaves in this case. All right, the final one that I wanna mention is one of my favorites and this is the modification of uh, leaves into, in, into traps for carnivory. Um, so this has happened multiple times in, in multiple different lineages of plants and in different ways. So people are familiar with the Venus flytrap. Um, that's a modified leaf as well, where the leaf has a system that, op that allows it to close on prey. Um, and uh, in the, the one that we're, we're showing here is actually a pitcher plant where the leaf has several different adaptations that create a, a, um, that create a basically a plant stomach, uh, this open-ended stomach that uh, has digestive enzymes um, and bacteria in it to digest prey. And so these are modified to trap and digest prey items. Why the heck are we doing this? Well, these typically grow in places that have, well, they do grow in places that are nutrient poor. Um, so in nutrient poor soils, especially, uh, we'll see modifications for, um, modifications for carnivory, like traps like this. And because nutrient poor soils are typically very low in nitrogen. Nitrogen is a limiting, uh, is a limiting nutrient in, in, in some environments. Um, and one good way to get nitrogen is actually to digest other organisms, animals, and be carnivorous. And so digesting those provides those nutrients in that nutrient-poor soil. Okay, so those are our, the last of our modifications. I wanna just take the last bit here and 
Although I could just give you the link to the YouTube video, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna actually tack it onto the end of this because um, I want to make sure that you watch this in association with this particular lecture. Um, I would normally play this in class, so I'm gonna play this for you here. Um, just as a little primer for this, this is uh, a YouTube video from a series that's called Plants Are Cool Too. And uh, I point this one out because right now this, I'm going to show you the first episode, um, but there are a series of, there's I think 13 episodes now. Um, this is done by a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Chris Martin from Bucknell University, and um, where he's put together this series that are, they range from five to 15 minute YouTube segments that basically go around to different researchers, botanical researchers that are doing cool work in plants and highlight their work. Um, and so I wanted to make sure to bring this one to your attention because this is one that if any, if any of this is like uh, sparking your imagination and making you think that plants are cool, let you know that there's this series out there and you can see what some of really cool research from really cool people um, is going on. And so this first video is, uh, this one is the one I'm going to show you is about carnivory. And it's the first, uh, it's the first video in this, in the plants, it's the first episode in the Plants Are Cool 2 series. Um, and so I encourage you to Google that and look for more of these um, and watch some more. They're really fun. Okay, so I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to switch over to uh, to YouTube and we'll go ahead and start this video. Fire ants on narcotics, plants with stomachs, and the thousands of mystery microbes that help to brew one stinky Louisiana gum. All this and more next on Plants Are Cool Too. Animals are cuddly, the animals are cute. You could put a kitten in a three-piece suit. But could an animal make a tofu? Could an animal feed the whole world? Could an animal help you get a girl? Plants go to, plants go to. Plants are cool. Plants Are Cool Too is made possible through the generous support of the Botanical Society of America, leading scientists and educators since 1893. Hey, this is Dr. Chris Martin. This is Plants Are Cool Too, the show where we fully acknowledge that animals are awesome, but plants are cool too. Today's example are gonna be bug eating plants deep in the heart of Louisiana. And we're here right now on our way to Abita Springs, about 40 miles north of New Orleans, where we're gonna meet my friend, Dr. Maggie Koopman. She's an expert on the pale pitcher plant, Saracenia alata. She's been working on this for a few years, has some really remarkable things to tell us about this awesome plant. Maggie's out in a longleaf pine savanna this morning, and we're gonna go see if we can track her down. Hey, Maggie, good morning. Good morning, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well. This is a really cool site. Thank you for meeting me out here. Yeah, my pleasure. And I'm assuming this is the thing we're looking for. This, this? is Saracenia alata. This That's is the male pitcher plant? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So a carnivorous plant yeah. living in a very nutrient-poor soil. Okay. And so it needs to supplement its nutrients somehow. Okay, not getting what it needs out of the soil, and then it's capturing organisms. Uh, yes, yeah. primarily insects. Uh-huh. And it's got to lure them to the plant somewhere. Okay, how does it do that? Well, it has these modified leaves. Okay. And so this leaf is modified to attract, trap, and then digest animals. That's really cool. All right, so you're telling me this is, this is a leaf. Like if I were to take a normal leaf like this and, and curl it up, I could make it exactly. into an insect Exactly, trap. that's right. what has happened over time. Okay, so how the heck? Does it get the insects to go in there? If I'm an insect and that's a trap, why do I even bother going near it? Right. Well, the plant is offering very high nutritious, very um, sweet nectar. 
Okay. okay. It's Where? offering it along the length of the leaf. Okay. Okay, so yep. crawling insects can be lured. Oh, this is some good stuff. Yep. Move on up. Follow the, the trail leaf. up the leaf. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately for the insect, yeah. the, the plant has laced the nectar at the lip yeah. with narcotics. <laughs> It changes the game a little bit when yeah, they get up to yeah, here, uh, right? And then nar narcotic, what, what happens to the insects? Well, they're well, gonna get a little woozy, yeah. hopefully gonna fall right in. Into the trap. Into the trap. Okay, and, and they fall in there, and then, then what happens? Well, it's a true trap. This The insects will likely never get out. Okay. Right? And that's because uh, inside the plant, there is a smooth, a waxy sort of slide. Okay. The insect is gonna zoom on down, yeah. and then, there are a series of downward pointing hairs okay. that are going to um, inhibit yeah. insects from coming So it's easy to down. slide down those hairs, but you can't come back up against them. No right? So now you're yeah. stuck down there. Yep. All right. What are they falling into? There's some. There's a liquid in there, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I, I call it fluid. Yeah. And it's essentially a plant stomach. Okay. So in that stomach, we get the digestion of these poor critters who got drunk and fell into the fish. Right. All right. That is really neat. Uh, I mean, is there a chance that we could actually cut one of these open and, and see what's going on inside? Absolutely. It's really fun to do that. Okay. Uh, this is one, just one plant. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to go to where there are a few more. Uh -huh. There's a phenomenal population of you uh, miles away. All so right. Let's go see let's it. Let's go check it out. Only eight or nine species of Saracenia pitcher plant occur on this planet. All of them found in the southeastern United States, and nearly all of them restricted to fire-dependent longleaf pine forests. As a consequence, as longleaf pine habitats decline, so do the numbers of pitcher plants. Fire plays an important role in the continual renewal of the longleaf pine forest where pitcher plants thrive. The survival of this special forest community is now largely dependent on prescribed burning by land managers. A lot of different stuff. Yeah, here, these yeah. are probably some of the most diverse community plant communities that are out in uh, this region of the country, actually. Oh, here they are already. Oh boy, we're already picking them up. There's a lot of pitcher plants out here, but this site seems quite a bit different than the last one we were in. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely drier yeah. and much more open. Yeah. Um, the other one seemed like it had been burned uh, pretty recently, right? Yeah, yeah, this looks like it's maybe burned more frequently, but less recently. recently. Yeah. All right, let's open one of these plants up. All right, that's a real monster. Oh, Need a knife. yeah. All right, put it right here at the base. Pretty tough. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a huge weight. That Look is really that. awesome. Really awesome. All right, so. It doesn't look like there? there's too much fluid in there. Uh -huh. I think I'm just going to rip some of them up here and okay. start seeing what we see. All right. So here it's kind of waxy, and then right here we see this differentiation. There's some hairs now starting to come So on. this is the slippery, waxy slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the long hairs that are going to keep Now them. we've come to another level here. These are starting to get wet. Yep. Well, what is that thing that we just got uh, covered in there? So that is a larvae. It's a it's a larvae. Yes. Yeah. It's hanging out here, living, thriving inside of the leaf. Yeah. Yeah. And he lives down in here, and he's kind of up at the edge at the top of this water column, yep. chomping up the big parts. So here we have some dead insects. Yeah. Uh, not even sure what they are anymore. Chunks of kinda, insect bodies. Yeah. Um, and he's so he's really. Scavenging, scavenging off the stuff that's already fallen into and, the And and yeah. starting starting at the, the largest level. So breaking up the largest pieces. Okay. Yeah. So what happens if we keep moving down in the pitcher? Well then things are just gonna get more and more broken down. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. So now we're deep in the stomach of the plant. This is the, the stinky soup. This is very fair up. Somebody's attracted to it. This fly is coming to see what it's about. But now that we have this thing all unraveled and, and, and flattened out, you can really see that it's 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 a leaf, just a leaf. Right, right. So it's much more like a blade that we know about. Yeah, uh, that we usually think of. Yeah. Yes, but yes. but uh, their natural form is to have curled up this whole structure mm -hmm. and make it an elongated insect. Yeah. 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 Yeah
amazing. Right. right. Really amazing stuff. And actually, if you uh, grow these plants with nutrients, yeah. they won't make pictures. They'll just be flat. Just a flat. Yeah. You're kidding. Nope. That's really awesome. <laughs> While it might look like we're destroying an entire plant, we're just exploring the contents of a single leaf. All of the pitcher-shaped leaves on this plant will die back at the end of this season and be replaced by new ones in the spring. Oh, uh, hey Maggie, come check this one out. What do you got? I don't know. Got a million ants down there. Is that yeah. possible that they'd still be moving around? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So ants are actually the largest prey item of this species. So they eat mostly. Oh gosh, that's gross. You better not be fire ants, dude. Oh no. <laughs> I hadn't really even thought of that possibility. Yeah, I don't know. It's a <laughs> distinct one. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they got to a certain point. <laughs> These guys are fire. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they got to a certain point where they hadn't quite fallen. They couldn't quite get up. Um, An awful lot of them in there. <laughs> yeah. They're happy to be out, actually. We just released them. We saved um, the ants. We also took away a pretty huge meal. For the ants. Yeah, that picture was good for the year. Yeah. We just disrupted the ant buffet. Too. Yeah. All right, this one is going to be it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This one is a very full stomach. Lots sure. and lots of ants. Dead. Check that out. Holy moly. Look at all of that biomass that this plant has collected. There's a bunch of mites. That were, are living in there? They're living, yep. So the mites are somewhat commensal. So in, the, in this case, the fluid is kind of dried up for whatever reason. Yeah. The ants are still, those corpses of ants are all still in there. They're still remaining. Uh, likely the next time it rains, yeah. rain will fall in. Yeah. And we'll see that digest. We'll see sort that. Of kick in again. Yeah, and not that it's not happening. You know? yeah. so it's yeah. a very yeah. wet, it's very wet in here. Yeah. Um, Oh, look at all of them. Yeah, let's, let's, cut it, let's cut it open. So just a short time ago, these were basically just a bunch of drunk ants. Holy mackerel. Yeah, right? Oh How many goodness, individuals look at all ants. is that? And you can't even see that they're ants, really. You can just see ant heads and thoraxes yeah, and, they're just and whatnot. Bits of partially digested ants. Yeah, yeah, look at that. That's incredible. Yeah. Do you want to do this one? I would get it at the base okay. far below where you see... Possible. So way down there. Down there. Yeah. Okay. And you All have right. something we can put this fluid in? To, yeah. For, uh, to look yeah. At? All right. It's, it's uh, a little pour spout. Let's do it. Holy All oh, right. There's some uh, ants in that one, yeah, too. Yeah. Different species, it looks like. Yeah. 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 Now, now, you've been part of a, a recent research project that shows that it, it, it's not just about plant enzymes and juice, but there's actually a lot more going on in this fluid than we ever knew. Right, yeah. right. So there are an enormous number of microorganisms yeah. living inside of this fluid. In the fluid. That is further breaking down this, these, uh, these prey. So a whole community of like, bacteria and things that are Bacteria yeah. especially is where, where my interests lie. Okay, so we've found uh, with this particular plant species yeah. Upwards of 800 different species. Not just individual. No, no. 800 different species of microorganisms in the fluid. In a, in a living single. In a, living in a single. In leaf. a single. Leaf. Yeah. 800 different species. Yeah, and you know what? what? <laughs> They're actually um, very, very similar to animal gut. So right? that flora of bacteria very very similar components so, to our stuff that's amazing stuff and that's not including the fungi algae the rotifers all sorts of other microorganisms that we don't even know about yet that we know they're in there we yeah. just don't know what they are we don't know what so we see a moth we see a, a beetle grub and that's just the tip of the ice this massive iceberg of diversity right. that lives in every single one of these pictures this is like Horton here's a who the whole world in there. hello down there right all yeah, down there exactly exactly the whole world in there that's insane Maggie thanks so much for meeting us out here my pleasure talking to us about these picture plants well, what are you going to do next with these things well, I'm looking at the microbial communities in another species of pitcher plant and seeing whether or not those microbial communities are necessary for plant plant what are you doing next 
going to have a cold boy sandwich and a nice cold sweet tea. I'm in Louisiana, baby. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Renipper's plants are exact. And uh, we will I'm gonna just end my sharing here. Um, go check out more of those Plants Are Cool too videos. They're fun uh, and uh, lots of cool plant, uh, lots of cool plant information out there. Okay, we'll come back next time and start talking a bit more about primary growth, secondary growth uh, in, in plants and how that contributes to plant structure and function. All right, thanks.